hear all the, the rambling, the people talking. It's good to hear that, you know, uh, as, as, as brothers and sisters coming from, you know, our different churches and different areas, it's all good to come together as, as, as one body, part of the body of Christ. Um, so a special welcome to, to Hope and Discovery, Rehoboth. Uh, welcome here to Maranatha this morning. I am Rob Vingis, one of the elders here. Today we are blessed to have Pastor Nicole <clears throat> from Hope. She'll be leading us in worship this morning, or in the sermon. And I'd like to welcome uh, the praise team up. Stand in body and her spirit. That would be awesome. We're going to uh, open in a call to worship. Our call to worship today comes from Isaiah 40, uh, verse 9 through 11. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up and do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See the sovereign God comes with power and his arm rules for him. See his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. We're going to open in uh, two songs here. Above all, you are my all in all and holy forever.
morning for worship, God is present here, and he greets us, so receive his greeting. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You can have a seat. This morning we've sung about God's holiness. The angels cry, holy. All creation cries, holy. You are lifted high, holy, holy forever. In the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah records a vision he has of God and his holiness. He writes this in Isaiah chapter 6. In the year King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and with the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. When we stand in awe of God's holiness, like Isaiah, we recognize our own shortcomings. It's as if the light of God's holy presence lights up the rooms of our houses, and we can see suddenly all the spots where there's dust and there's dirt. And yet, God accepts us anyways, imperfect as we may be. Isaiah goes on to write, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Through the person of Jesus, God himself makes a way for imperfect people to be in right relationship with a holy God. It's because of Jesus that we can come before God this morning in a prayer of confession. Would you pray with me? Holy God, you are awesome, glorious. You are above all. We come into the, your presence this morning and we are in awe of who you are and of what you have done. We also come into your presence aware of our own shortcomings and failures. We confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we have not loved our neighbors as we have loved ourselves. Thank you that you do not treat us as our sins deserve. As the psalmist writes in Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed your transgressions, our transgressions from us. Thank you for the atoning work of Jesus Christ that brings us into right relationship with you again. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit who continues to work within each of us, transforming us so that we more and more are able to reflect your grace, your truth, and your love to those around us. Thank you that because of what you've done and continue to do, we are able to say, it is well with my soul, no matter what is going on in our lives or in the world around us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. As we reflect on the assurance and the peace we find through Christ, let's join our voices together as we sing, When Peace Like a River.
I would like to invite all the children that are from four to eight years old up for a children's message. You do have Sunday school afterwards, so if you're a little older and you want to come up, that's fine, but uh, if you're not, if you're, Sunday school is for the four to eight-year-olds. And I'd like you to sit along here if you could, because there will be a little bit of audience participation this morning, and I'd like the, for them to see this. Good morning. How are you? You're looking really good this morning. My name is Ray, in case you didn't know. Okay? Now, I have a question for you. Do you have any brothers or sisters? He's your brother, and he's your only brother? Do you have any sisters? So you have one brother. Do you have any brothers or sisters? You have one brother and two sisters. And one more. How many do you have? You have one brother and two sisters, too. Well, isn't that... How many do you have? I have two sisters and one brother. Two sisters and one brother and... I have three sisters. Three sisters. Do you have any brothers? No brothers. Oh. Do you want to guess how many I have? Take a guess. Three? That's close. That's, pardon? Seven. That's a little high. Five. So between three and five, I have, I have four sisters. But I don't have any brothers. No brothers at all. So I'm, I'm with you. I, I know what it's like to live in a female household. <laughs> Boy, do I know. <laughs> so do you... Do you always get along with your brothers and sisters? No, no, you don't. I, I don't always get along with my sisters either. And sometimes, sometimes I hear that they're upset with me. I just found out that one of my sisters is upset with me. So when she comes back from this weekend, I have to say I'm sorry and, and solve that problem with her. She's mad because I didn't ask her to go golfing with me, but still, it's a problem, right? But I have another question. Do you always love your brother and sister? Yes. Anybody else? Yes. Even though we might have some troubles with them, sometimes we always love them, don't we? But you know what? I think I... Uh... Now, I said I have four sisters. You have three sisters. You have two brothers and a sister, right? One brother and one sister. But you know, all those answers are kind of not right. Did you know that? Did you know that? We actually have way more brothers and sisters that we can count. Do you want, do you want me to show you? Okay. Okay, 7.5 billion. That's, that's the estimate. So... Here's where the audience participation comes in. If you're a young lady, a little lady, a mature lady, or a senior, what I'd like you to do is just wave and say hi. Can you do that? Wave and say hi. Oh, come on. You can do better than that. Let's do it again. Wave and say hi. Do you see all them? And now for the men. Men? The ladies already showed you how it's done. I'd like you to wave and say hi. Can you do that? Hi. They, they are all our brothers and sisters. Isn't that cool? Now the Bible, I can tell you that because the Bible says that. If we are children of God, if we love God, we are children of God. And they always says, and brothers and sisters in Christ. But you do know what I couldn't find in the Bible? I couldn't find anywhere where it says we're cousins. I couldn't find anywhere where it says we're nieces and nephews. I couldn't find any other reference 
to any other family member other than brothers and sisters. Isn't that cool? So all these people, and how many did you say? 7.1 billion? If we love Jesus, we are all brothers and sisters together. And you know what other thing I think is really neat? If they're all our brothers and sisters, coming to church is kind of like a family reunion, isn't it? <laughs> I think that's really neat. So I'd like to pray over you, and then as we sing our song, you can go to Sunday school then, okay? So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, that we can call you Father, so that no matter our age, whether we're four, whether we're 14, 24, 40, 80, or older, we are brothers and sisters. We are not just individuals. We are part of your family. And thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we sing a song, you guys may go to Sunday school, okay? And that's out the back. Okay, you may go. Thank you. always nice to hear the children, but uh, Ray, I have a few more siblings than you do, so. Five sisters and four brothers, so. Before we come together in the congregational prayer, just have a couple of announcements, or just one announcement. Um, last week, Pastor Darren and Laurel had a baby girl, and we'd like to... Uh, May God bless them as she grows, and may God bless Pastor Darren and Laurel as they raise their daughter in the Lord. <laughs> Psalm 40 reads, I wait patiently for the Lord. He lifted me up out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on the rock, and he gave me a firm place to stand. Shall we, come to the word, uh, shall we come to the Lord in prayer? Lord, you are amazing. All around, we are in awe of your creation. From the small insects to the large animals, you created them all. And you still had time to create humans in your own likeness. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We love you. Lord, we pray for our families. In this past week, so many of our friends have passed away, and we pray for the families left behind. We pray for our friends who are in the hospital. Lord, you are the healer and the giver of life. Heavenly Father, you give life and you take it away. To you be the glory, now and forevermore. 
Help your church to grow in you, we pray. The school year is now over. Thank you, Lord, for taking care of our students and teachers through, this, through the year. Please lead our youth as they make decisions for their future studies, and may they continue to grow in you. Lord, thank you for our country, Canada. We are so blessed to be able to call Canada home. Thank you for the beauty all around us. Work in our hearts. Work in, our, in the hearts of our leaders. May our country draw near to you. We pray that you lead Pastor Nicole today as she presents us your word. Open our hearts and our minds today to what you are saying to us. We pray this in your most holy and awesome name. Amen. On a side note, uh, today's service is not being live streamed currently. It is being recorded and will be uh, able to be downloaded later. Uh, we, with the construction going on outside, they have cut our internet cable and we are without internet. So it will be a live stream later on, just not at the moment. So if anyone asks later on, they couldn't get on, it's going to be available after the service. During our combined services this morning, we're gonna be focusing on the theme of belonging. So this morning, we're gonna talk about what it means to belong to Christ. And then in August, we'll look at what it means to belong to the church. And in September, we'll look at what it means to belong to the community. And together, we'll discover how these themes of belonging shape our identity and our purpose as individuals and as a community. So this morning as we explore belonging to Christ, I invite you to turn to John chapter 10, verses 1 to 18. And if you have the same Bible as up here, it would be page 1527. But before we read, let's come before God in a word of prayer. Loving God, as we open your word this morning, we ask that you would speak to us. Be at work in our hearts. Open our hearts to what you have to say to us this morning. Teach us what it means to follow you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 10, verses 1 to 18. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the door for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow them because they know his voice. But they will never follow the voice of a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to, to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. 
just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep, too, that are are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They, too, will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to, to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I have received from my Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Come with me to the Judean wilderness. It's a harsh landscape, dry, dusty, barren. When it rains, it's beautiful, bursting into color with streams appearing in the wilderness. But most of the year, it's a challenge to survive in the wilderness, especially if you're a sheep. For a sheep in the wilderness, your first challenge is is to find food and water, sustenance. There's not much of it in the wilderness. Then your next challenge is the predators. There's predators all around who who see a nice sheep and think, dinner. If you're a sheep in the wilderness, you need a shepherd. Someone who can take care of you and lead you along safe paths to show you where, where there's good pasture and where there is water hidden. Someone who will stand between you and the enemy when they are trying to attack. But not everybody who shows up to lead the sheep in the wilderness is a good shepherd. Not everyone has their best interests at heart. In John 10, Jesus talks about other dangers sheep face. Thieves and robbers who will try to break into the sheep pen and steal them. Hired hands who look like shepherds, but at the end of the day will abandon them for their own safety when a wolf comes to attack. These figures represent leaders who fail their people. Within the context of John 10, Jesus is specifically criticizing the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his time. He mentions them at the very beginning of this passage. And in the context, in in John chapter 9, just before this passage, the Pharisees have just finished harshly interrogating a man who was born blind who Jesus had healed. Through their their actions, they show that their focus is more on rules and regulations than it is on caring for those who are under their authority. They may see themselves as shepherds of the people, but their actions show that they are hired hands at best. We find hired hands in the church today, too. People who lead in selfish ways that are detrimental to those who they are called to serve. I think of the story, the sickening story I heard last year of a a CRC pastor who was found guilty of of murdering an eight-year-old girl back in the 70s. Or the story of the pastor in Toronto charged with sexual assault or the story about the renowned Christian apologist who engaged in shocking sexual misconduct. Recent years have brought us story after story that are disappointing and heartbreaking. Stories of of leaders in the church whose moral failings have had a devastating impact on the people they're called to serve and on the witness of the church. It's easy to think of of those dramatic examples, but there are more subtle failures too. Leaders who neglect their duties, who fail to care for the hurting, or take advantage of their position of trust for personal gain. These too can damage the community and erode trust. For all those who find themselves in a position of leadership, Jesus' words in John 10 invite reflection. Are you a shepherd or are you a hired hand? Are you leading primarily for a paycheck because it'll look good on your resume or or because the position that it brings you in the community? 
Or do you serve out of a genuine love and care for the people, for the sheep? Being a hired hand is much easier. You can be there when things are going well, point out to your job description and say, that's not really part of my job when things are getting a bit too difficult. And if it gets really hard, just leave. To be a shepherd, to truly love all the sheep, even the difficult and demanding ones, that's a challenge. Especially in a polarized world where trust and leadership has been eroded. Shepherd or hired hand? I ask myself that question sometimes as someone who's standing up here and has the title pastor in their name. And as much as I strive to live into my ordination vows, there are days when I have to be honest with myself that I can think and act more like a hired hand sometimes. The calling to shepherd can be overwhelming, and there are days when I feel inadequate in the face of the needs that I see. There's always more that one could do to care for the sheep. I'm guessing I'm not alone in that struggle. In the midst of the challenges of the the past years of of COVID and the, the division and conflict in our congregations around the Human Sexuality Report and other issues, there's been a rise in, in pastors who have stepped down from leading in our denomination. Reports show that in Canada, we have an alarming number of vacant churches. And, and many churches also struggle each year to find enough people who will say, yes, I will let my name stand for elder, for deacon, to serve in these important roles of leadership in our congregations. We need help. Struggling leaders and followers alike need guidance and direction beyond that that we can find on the self-help section of the bookstore or in the videos we find on YouTube. We long to be led by someone who knows us personally, who can provide for our needs, both the ones we know and even our unspoken needs and who will be there to to protect us and have our backs when life gets hard and challenging. We need a, a good shepherd like the one Jesus describes in John chapter 10. I am the good shepherd, Jesus says. Unlike the hired hands who care nothing for the sheep and flee when things get tough, Jesus stays. He loves those who follow him so much that he is willing to lay down his life for them. In the chapters following John chapter 10, we see Jesus do just that as we read of his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. Jesus lays down his life so that those who follow him can have life and life abundant. I am the gate for the sheep, Jesus says. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to to kill and destroy. I have come that may, may have life and have it to the full. Jesus draws a sharp contrast between his leadership and that of the religious leaders of his time. He reaches out to those who have been hurt by failed leaders, and he invites them to find a place to belong, a place to belong in him. To belong to Jesus means to be embraced in a relationship. In John 10, Jesus says that just as he knows the Father and just as the Father knows him, so too he knows his sheep and the sheep know him. The intimacy of this relationship between Jesus and his sheep is like that of Jesus and his father. The the relationship of father and son in the Trinity. That's amazing when you stop to think of it and consider it. To belong to Jesus is also to be provided for. Now this doesn't mean that, that life will be free from challenges or problems when you are a follower of Jesus. Quite to the contrary, Jesus says later in in the book of John that in this world you will have trouble, but take heart because I have overcome 
the world. But what belonging to Jesus means that in the midst of the troubles of this life, those who belong to Jesus are held safe and secure in his love. Thieves and robbers may come to the sheep pen and try to steal. Wolves may come and try to attack the flock. But even in our darkest time, even when we feel like we don't know where to turn to next, Jesus is there. Jesus is with us, even when we face death itself. Psalm 23 puts it this way, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And even death, that last great enemy, does not triumph in the end. Paul reminds us in the book of Romans that there is nothing, not even death itself, that will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. These rich themes of of belonging are beautifully captured in the words of an ancient document, the Heidelberg Catechism, that was written about 450 years ago. Listen to these words from question and answer one and take them to heart. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong, body and soul, in life and and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. These words were written over 450 years ago by young leaders in the church. Leading wasn't easy in their day either. The Reformation was underway, transforming the political and religious landscape of Europe. There were struggles, and it was a time of turmoil, change, and controversy, and even persecution and danger in the church. And yet, these young leaders knew about the hope and the joy that comes from belonging to Christ, and confident in that belonging and that identity given them through Christ, they poured their energy into leading his people well. They worked to craft the Heidelberg Catechism, a document that that would help explain their faith, help bring different factions of Protestant groups together, and help show what the core tenets of their faith were. I'm grateful for them, and I'm grateful for the leaders the church continues to be blessed with today. I'm grateful this morning to, to hear that Pastor Darren Hogendorn has accepted a call to serve here at Maranatha Church, and I'm grateful for the gift that is to all of you in our sister congregation. I'm grateful, too, for the gift it is to see Pastor Ryan Narula continue to grow in his gifts of leadership as he pursues studies at Calvin Theological Seminary, even as he faithfully serves our combined youth ministry here in Clarington. And at Hope Fellowship Church, Every time I leave one of the meetings we have with our elders, I am just blown away by the care and the love and the grace that those people show and their dedication to leading our church well. God has blessed us with good leaders. As I'm reminded of them, I'm reminded that for every story we hear of a fallen leader, There are countless others who are quietly and faithfully caring for their communities. We might not always hear their names in the news or hear about them because often what they do doesn't get in the spotlight and that's the way they would like it to be because they don't care about the attention or the praise. They serve because they care about the people. I imagine that 
you are likely here today or taking in this service online later on today because of people like that, leaders in the church who made an impact on your lives. I know I certainly wouldn't be up here preaching a sermon if it wasn't for the leaders, the countless leaders in the church who spoke truth into my life over the years, who mentored me and encouraged me. Leaders from, from GEMS counselors and, and Sunday school teachers to youth leaders and elders and mentors and other pastors. People who encouraged me, named gifts they saw in me, who challenged me when they saw my life going in, in different directions and, and encouraged me to continue to follow. People who pointed me through their words and actions back to Jesus Christ, the one true shepherd. These men and women weren't perfect. They didn't meet all my needs. They themselves were not the good shepherd. And yet, their leadership was effective, not because they were perfect, be because they knew the good shepherd. They knew Jesus. They listened to his voice and submitted to his leadership in their lives, and as they did so, they were able to teach others, too, to hear his voice, to point them to him. As you listen to the Good Shepherd's voice, you may hear echoes of a conversation Jesus had with the disciple Peter after his resurrection. Do you love me? Jesus asked. And if you answer, yes, Jesus, I love you, you may just hear Jesus say to you, Feed my sheep. The, the exact words may sound a little bit more like, would you let your name stand for elder this year? Or, hey, you're really good with kids. Have you ever considered teaching Sunday school? You should really think about seminary, perhaps. No thank you may be your initial response. Surely there's someone else who can do that. Someone who would be much better at it than me. Someone more gifted, more equipped. Someone more perfect. But God has a way of being persistent when he calls. And who knows but that God has placed you where you are for such a time as this. It's not an easy time to be a leader in the church in our world today. There are pitfalls and there are challenges all around. But to those who are currently considering leadership roles in the church or those who currently are serving in leadership, Jesus' words in John 10 not only come as a challenge, but as a comfort. Our Good Shepherd is with us. He knows the way forward, even when we do not. And he will be with us every step of the way. We can only lead effectively when we are first and foremost dedicated daily to following him. As leaders, it's not our job to have all the answers. It's not our job to hold everything together. It's not our job to keep everyone in the flock, to keep everyone happy and at peace with each other to make sure all the siblings are getting along. It's not our job to save anyone, fix anyone, or force things to go in a certain direction. The job of the leader is to point people to Christ, our Savior. To remind them that the good news that in this crazy world we live in, we have a source of leading, of guiding, and of direction and of care reminding them of his invitation to find belonging in relationship with him, and trusting that at the end of the day, we can rest in the knowledge that we have a good shepherd, Jesus, who knows and loves the people under our care in a way that is beyond our human capacity. Would you pray with me? Loving shepherd, Thank you for knowing us, caring for us, guiding us, and protecting us. Thank you that we can find security and comfort knowing that our identity is found in you. 
We give you thanks for all those who serve as leaders in our churches. Strengthen each one in the roles you've called them to. Give them wisdom and understanding as they navigate different situations. Protect them from the attacks that come their way. When they feel discouraged or overwhelmed, remind them of your faithful presence and of your love and care. Continue to leave each one of us, too, in our daily lives. Teach us to hear your voice more clearly and give us courage to follow where you lead, even when the path ahead is hard. Refresh us and renew us when we get tired and fill us with joy in living for you as we live the life you laid down your life so we could live, life to the full. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing in response, The Lord my shepherd rules my life. This week's Deacon's Cause is in support of Gate 316 Outreach Center. Gate, Gate 316 is located in Oshawa and offers light meals, health care service, laundry facilities, counseling, and literacy training. The prayers and financial donations allow this ministry to help over 3,700 marginalized people in Durham region every month. Shall we come to God in prayer for Gate 316? Lord, use these gifts today to help the work at Gate 316. Bless this ministry, we pray, in your name, amen.
As we come to the end of this time of worship together, we prepare to go out again into the coming week to live our daily lives as followers of Jesus Christ. And as we go out, God sends us out with these words of blessing from the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verses 20 to 21. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's join our voices in a closing song of blessing. Mm -hmm.